Oh, hi there. Well, welcome back to 19th and 20th century philosophy. I'm Matt Brown. Today we're going to talk about Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche, the proto-existentialist philosophers. Now, Soren Kierkegaard was Danish. He lived in the first half of the 19th century, published most of his major works between the 1940s and the 1950s. Friedrich Nietzsche was German, lived primarily in the latter half of the 19th century, um, and he, most of his published works, uh, uh, major works were published in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, there are lots of similarities between these proto-existentialist thinkers. Um, among other things, they both uh, wrote in a very uh, literary style, um, they both used complicated forms of philosophical writing um, besides the sort of systematic treatise. Both were reacting ne negatively against the ideas of Hegel. Um, they saw Hegel as a kind of arch-rationalist philosopher um, who was problematic on many grounds. And they sought in place of Hegel's systematic rationalist philosophy to try to find a philosophical point of view that could speak to questions of how to live an authentic human life. Um, both were doing philosophy that had a very psychological, um, uh, uh, that had a very psychological side to it, a very personal, almost psychoanalytic side to it, um, and that was focused on um, questions of life and, and human existence. Both took Socrates as a main uh, sort of influence. We're quite interested in uh, ancient Greek philosophy generally, but Socrates in particular. One major difference concerning Kierkegaard and Nietzsche is there's differing attitudes towards religious belief. So Soren Kierkegaard was a deeply religious thinker, Christian. Um, a major part of his uh, complaint about Hegel was the heretical nature of Hegel's philosophy of the absolute. Nietzsche was an um, anti-religious thinker, uh, deeply antipathetic towards Christianity in particular, um, and this informed uh, a, a lot of their writing, both of their writings significantly. Kierkegaard, um, as I said, uh, was um, really very much um, a psychological thinker in addition to a philosophical thinker. Um, in, in particular, he pioneered a lot of thinking, very advanced for his time, about the nature of certain kinds of um, psychological phenomena like anxiety and dread. Um, he worried about the feeling of alienation. I think it's important to note that um, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche like Marx and Mill in different ways, are dealing with um, aspects of the human condition that arise in the 19th century as the world becomes more urban, more industrialized, and the, um, the lives that people lead uh, become, you know, go through some radical transformations. You know, the late 18th century, of course, uh, saw a number of political revolutions, that affected this um, early 19th century as well. Um, and so they're reacting in part to some of the issues of their time. Um, and, and so a, a sense of alienation, a sense of anxiety, um, concerns about the relationship between the society and the individual are very keen in the minds of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. One of the key ideas of Soren Kierkegaard's philosophy is the three stages of life. That is the aesthetic stage, the ethical stage, and the religious stage. These are the stages that Kierkegaard thought um, a sort of prototypical person would go through in their search for a satisfactory or authentic way of living. The aesthetic stage is one in which um, we seek to satisfy our desires. We seek pleasure. According to Kierkegaard, you know, the, the, the difficulty with the aesthetic phase is boredom. Eventually, various pleasures will lose 
their novelty and their interest for us. And we'll come uh, to, to find ourselves dissatisfied with the aesthetic life. Um, the second stage, the ethical stage, is one where we seek to live according to a system of rules of ethical or moral behavior. Um, and this is one that Kierkegaard thinks the, the failures of the aesthetic life naturally lead us to, but the ethical life also for Kierkegaard ultimately fails um, because we, we have to deal with competing or conflicting moral requirements. The various ethical rules that we follow um, uh, lead us to impossible uh, choices where there's no way to do the right thing. And um, this, according to Kierkegaard, leads us to a recognition of sin um, and the sort of inevitably sinful nature of humanity, and so also is dissatisfactory. The final stage, the religious phase stage, requires a leap of faith. And the leap of faith um, is uh, a, a, a a matter of a personal relationship to, to God, right? So it's a kind of religious life led not by reason, not by a desire for the good uh, or for pleasure, but by a personal relationship with, with God. So finally, the notion of the leap of faith leads us to the reading for today, uh, which talks about the concept of truth as subjectivity. Now, by this, Kierkegaard does not mean, you know, just believe whatever you want. It's all a matter of opinion, man. Like, truth is just whatever you want to believe. Nothing like that. What Kierkegaard means here is that truth, the kind of ultimate significant truth of our existence, is a matter of a deep personal commitment to something. Obviously here, the key notion being religious commitment. Okay. So for, for, for Kierkegaard, although he has no problem with the notion of objective science per se, the, the sort of ultimate meaningful notion of truth that he's working with um, is one where truth is about a, a subjective personal commitment. The contrast for truth as subjectivity is not objective science so much, the contrast is really the, the opinion of the crowd, right? Going with, going with what the crowd says to get along with the crowd as opposed to believing something because it speaks to you in a deep personal way. Now with Nietzsche, it's a somewhat different story. Nietzsche too is concerned, of course, with um, how to live an authentic life. He is also inspired by the Greeks. Um, he al is also deeply engaged with ideas from Christianity. But for Nietzsche, you might say it all went wrong when uh, the Christians ascended to social power. Um, what I mean by this is, according to Nietzsche, what Christianity represented was a, a point of view that was designed for um, slaves, for oppressed people who, in the context of uh, the Roman Empire, were, um, uh, you know, not able to have their own sort of political or personal power. And so uh, Christianity was a way of reconciling themselves to their fate, uh, dealing with their resentment about the way that they lived uh, by dreaming of a world beyond this one uh, where they would be happy. Um, this all went wrong, according to Nietzsche, when um, Christianity became sort of socially powerful because now you have a society that is um, teaching people what he called a slave morality. Um, and he thought our, our ideas about good and evil were sort of deeply infected with uh, this problematic history. Um, Nietzsche also um, sort of conceived of an alternative perspective in which uh, courageous, creative individuals, um, which he called the Ubermensch or the Superman um, or the Overman would, um, what are you doing? What are you doing? You 
you are causing so much trouble today, and I've got to shoot a video. Come on. Which he called the Ubermensch, or Superman, or Overman, would come to sort of create their own values uh, through through a, an act of a personal choice, right, of uh, almost artistic creation. Um, and uh, it was this conception that uh, drove a lot of what he was thinking about. You may know Nietzsche from his concept of the death of God, which is a kind of commentary on uh, the, the um, sort of vacant nature of religious belief in, in contemporary, that is, mid-19th, late-19th century society. Um, and in The Twilight of the Idols, we explore some of these concepts, as well as his own nature, his, his own exploration of the nature of truth um, and objectivity. Like Kierkegaard, he's, he's, he's um, very much anti-rationalist, -ra um, and he, uh, he has a view which some have called perspectival in nature. He sees the, the nature of, of truth itself as, as somehow tied to human perspectives and denies the existence of a kind of God's eye view on the universe. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to some of the main ideas of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, um, and what brings them together as a pair. Um, we'll obviously talk more about the segments from Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols and the segment on truth and subjectivity from Kierkegaard uh, later today in class or on Discord. Um, also, if you have any comments about uh, what I said in the video or questions, please feel free to uh, send me a note or leave a comment here on the video. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next week. Um, and uh, uh, I look forward to talking to you again about 19th and 20th century philosophy.